Yeah, it's anyway, crazy how uh, I went uh, from uh, uh, talking about climbing up on the roof if we hired Dan Quinn to like, uh, he might be all right. <laughs> I was trying to, I was, he might I, be I, was right. all, I was on here on Monday trying to talk a little bit of sense in here. And here we are. Day. Wild ride here. It's Washington in football fan. It's a wild ride. I thought <laughs> I thought we could finally sit at the cool kids table, but not yet. Not yet. We're still they're still giving us noogies out here, guys. What a wild ride on the head coach of Carousel it has been. Pot requests that we start with a little quick recap. So I'm gonna give you a quick recap for those of y'all who are not as obsessed as we are, and for that matter, good for you. Your mental health is probably a lot better than both of us. This has been a roller coaster of the last couple of days. Uh, I mean, yeah, it was a tough, tough few days. So the head coach at Carousel has spun around and around and around, and we have landed lots of new information, lots of changes since we last spoke with you guys. Let's get into it. So the Atlanta Falcons hired Raheem Morris. Raheem Morris, defensive coordinator for the Rams, former head coach. They were looking Belichick. They pivoted at the last minute. You and I said, hey, that's a great hire. That was like our 1C, maybe our third option in D.C. That should He should be good down in Atlanta. Leader of men type, right? Carolina Panthers hired Dave Canales, Bucks offensive coordinator. Young, sharp offensive mind. Was, uh, you know, credited a lot for the Baker Mayfield turnaround and what Tampa's done in this past year. Great hire there, I think. Los Angeles Chargers, Jim Harbaugh. Old Jimmy's a tough son of a gun, but you know what? He wins. That's what they need in Los Angeles right now after the Brandon Staley experiment. Great job. Las Vegas Raiders hire Antonio Pierce. Antonio Pierce turned that team around, gave him some swag after the McCain that failed. Really? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Very good. Good inside there for Pop. New England Patriots hired Gerard Mayo. He was uh, the coach in the waiting, apparently training under Belichick. He was going to be the heir to the throne. Um, It happened pretty much immediately. They were ready to go on that. Tennessee Titans hire Brian Callahan. This one kind of came off the top ropes. Offensive coordinator in Cincinnati, been there since 2019, credited for a lot of Joe Burrow development, those kinds of things, credited with Mike Browning and how well he did in the last year. And kind of, you know, they kept that Cincinnati team afloat for for a while. Um, even without Burrow, I think they still finished with a winning record or close to it, um, which was pretty impressive. So that was a big hire there. Uh, Seattle Seahawks, Mike McDonald. The this young one hurt. Defensive mastermind out of Baltimore. Kicked the league's door down this year. Made a name for himself. The Baltimore Ravens had a historically good defense. Hell, Even up through that AFC Championship loss, they held Patrick Mahomes to three points through three quarters. That is pretty damn good, if I say so. Did you happen to see the video of the welcome that they gave him? I don't want to look at it. I can't think about it. It's (laughs) good. If you didn't. I can't think about it. It's pretty Um, phenomenal, actually, if if you look at it neutrally. At 36, he'll become the NFL's youngest head coach. And if he wasn't going to land in D.C., I'm a little partial to the Seahawks, so I'm not – against that, and I think it's a good fit with what they have there. Um, Our insider might not be too sized. No Ravens fans are sized at all. They're very yeah. all very disappointed. I heard a lot of Ravens fans were saying, hey, maybe it's time to move on from old, uh, old Johnny and let Mike take the reins, which I thought was crazy, and I think you would have written him a blank check in D.C. to come over here. Um, Ravens fans, I got to say this, they're a little unstable. <laughs> they, can't, they can't handle it. They can't handle prosperity. When the team's doing well, it's we're going to win it all, we're going to the Super Bowl. And then as soon as you hit one bump in the road and all of a sudden it's a nuclear situation. <sighs> Anyways, let's not get into that. Uh, and the Washington Commanders, you guys might note there is one name. There is the hottest name in the head coaching search. Still has not been named in the Washington Commanders. Supposedly the, the best destination for a head coach, supposedly. And what did the Washington Commanders get? 
Ugats. Absolutely screwed. Nothing. Ben Johnson staying in Detroit. That's what this episode's about. Ben Johnson staying in Detroit. Our reaction to that. And what the hell are we going to do? That's that's where we're at. That's The table is set. Pop, sit down, manja, eat. Let the people know how you're feeling. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe maybe one last loose end, the kind of you know, great setup there to, to talk about. But who are the candidates actually left for the commanders? I don't know if you want to get into that now or we react yeah, to Ben Johnson and sure. then go Let's, there. We could yeah. name the candidates left very quick. Uh, Anthony Weaver, Ravens associate head coach and defensive line coach. Dan Another young Ian. guy, right? Younger. Yeah, young yeah. 43, I think. Uh, so young. Dan Quinn, you know that guy. Aaron Glenn, you probably am not, are not that familiar with him because his defense was ranked 30th last year. But if you're a fan of Hard Knocks, you know who he is, Lions defensive coordinator. Um, that's it. And NEB. Oh, yeah. How could I forget? Eric B. Enemy. Yeah, it's Anyways, crazy how I went up, from uh, talking about climbing up on the roof if we hired Dan Quinn to like, uh, he might be all right. I was, trying, I, was, <laughs> I, was all, right. I was on here on Monday <laughs> trying to talk a little bit of sense into you. And here we are. Here we are. Go oh ahead. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, I was going to come on here. And I even before I came on here, I was trying to put a positive spin on this thing. But the reality is there's no positive spin you can put on it. Um, you had a good line about that. I won't steal it. I'll let you make it. But, you know, it, it, it's clearly the first setback for Josh Harris and company. Um, yeah, I don't know that I put it all on Adam Peters. I'd put it more on Harris than Peters. I'd... I think they're a group. They miscalculated this thing. You know, clearly their their top two were Johnson and McDonald. And, you know, you'll get into maybe more on your theories of what happened with Johnson. I can counterpoint that. And then McDonald, you know, rumor has it they were they were trying to get him to not get on the plane to Seattle. And maybe from his perspective, we can't get inside his head. He said, Hey, I was your number two choice. I'm already locked in there. You know, too bad. Um, but it's, it's, it's just, it's a miscalculation. There's really no good way to spin it. They're clearly on the plan B or C or even D at this point, because if Dan Quinn was the guy, why wouldn't he be hired already? I mean, yeah. maybe this will air Thursday morning. We're recording pretty late Wednesday night, so there won't be too big of a gap between the recording and when it airs, but. It's wild, and it's so quiet, you know, out there. There's there's really no information whatsoever. Everybody just assumed it was going to be Ben Johnson, and then, you know, then everyone just quickly pivoted to Mike McDonald, which never felt like it was too big of a possibility. And then, you know, now what are we left with? Can't get too excited about any of these guys, if I'm being honest. Yeah, so that – the. All of a sudden, the Schefter report drops Sunday night while you and I are recording, and I kind of mentioned it to you. We were both like, oh, we're not too worried about that. You were Schefter hating on Shefty. I was, I was Shefty doesn't Shefty. get it wrong. Shefty doesn't get it wrong very often. I mean, I maintain my something. feelings. I maintain my feelings about Shefty. It was, a, it was a spineless take because he said it may still happen, but it may not. That's, that's just that's a waste of air. And he went on the Pat McAfee show the next morning, kind of doubled down, said he'd be willing to bet that Dan Quinn in Seattle and Ben Johnson in D.C., that at least one of those will not be happening. Maybe both. And I think he knew about Mike McDonald in Seattle at that point in time because I think if Schefter knew that Ben Johnson was not going to come to D.C., Schefter would have said it. He Nobody knew there was the He knew there was it. issues. Maybe he knew there was trouble. He knew there was issues and there. So that's what leads me to to my my take on the Ben Johnson thing. Are you ready to just get into in the yes. Johnson talk, so to speak, here, Pop? Johnson. Johnson talk. 
new segment on Dalva Pond. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> for, sponsor by Manscaped. Uh, first and last time. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that's what brings me to think, you know, with the reports of – uh, this is me trying to be optimistic. I mean, if you want to go the, we could have had the next coming of Sean McVay and we blew it. I can't blame you for going that route. If you want to go that route, that's certainly what the you have no math, idea. math would lead you to believe. The other side of the coin is we could have had the second coming of Josh McDaniels and got lucky. And if I'm reading, in between, the, if I'm reading in between the lines – that's how I feel about this situation right now. He said a couple of pretty telling things in that presser about not wanting to be a part of a losing season. Um, and he said the reports about what his demands were. I was hearing he was asking for second contract money for his first contract and was asking for even more than that, asking what somebody like an Andy Reid would get paid, like just exorbitant amounts of money coming out of the gate. And I, I think those asks tell you about – I don't know. Those asks in combined with that quote rub me the wrong way. I won't jump to any further conclusions. They rub me the wrong way. And combine that with the notifying the team as the plane is in the air on the way to Detroit, that's just bad business. You can say, oh, you don't really know until you're in the situation. Bottom line, that's bad business one way or the other. That bridge is burnt. So I agree. I agree. I think I think so, I, I'm I'm good with everything you said there. Yeah, I'll keep it I'll keep it a little more conservative on here, but that's that's my that's my general take on the Ben Johnson thing. Obviously, I'm incredibly disappointed. Obviously, I've been ringing the Ben Johnson bell since I mean, like week 5 of the regular season. Like you could probably find things be talking about him a year ago. I've been on so this where are the Lions on the, on the Dami most liked versus most hated non-Washington commanders teams? Because they were pretty be, high at the most liked. I was all over. A few, couple of days ago. I'll be honest with you. I hope they suck next year. I really – I don't <laughs> – There you go. That's I can't fun. root for that guy. I can't root for that guy. I mean, he completely bent us over. He completely screwed our team. Part of my, my euphemisms there is just – it's not – there's no way. I hope they go 4-13 and 13 and he never gets another interview, honestly. I've tried to preach to you, son. You should care about one thing. Washington Commanders and hating on the rest of the NFC East. The rest of it, don't pick a favorite team. It's only – it's better to just live or die and be disappointed. They weren't, one group. They weren't my favorite team. They made me some money betting. <laughs> there you go. I mean, here, here's the thing. Here, here's the thing. Like, I, you know, in this situation, it's natural. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of reading between the lines. What do we know? We know that he had big contract demands. That was on the table from the beginning. And that some alarms, spooked some teams, per some definitely. alarms are exact going off. Spooked. Some alarms are going off rated, related to that. I mean, you know, coach doesn't count against salary cap, but certainly if you lay out that kind of cash as an owner, it's going to hurt if it doesn't work out. So, and, you know, um, you know, and then you're starting to hear about other kind of demands about player personnel and different little things here and there. And certainly I think he got a little bit over his skis with what he was looking at money wise, but, you know, at the end of the day, I also understand the idea of like somebody, you know, he's engrossed in coaching a football team and the emotions of doing that and running that team and he was all in. If you see him on the sidelines on Sundays, all in. He's As he emotionally invested in that. So he really can only dedicate, you know, a small percentage of his thought process to this idea of being a head coach. And it really got down to two teams, which I really think at the end it got down to one team for him because I'm not sure how much he was really in contention or in consideration in Seattle. And he just took a good hard look at it. and. You know, maybe the full contract terms weren't being met. And he looked at it and said, you know what? I got a good situation here. I want to stay. And I do think it's as simple as that. Because to turn down, you and I were trying to do the math. But let's say, you know, he's somewhere in the 8 to $10 million a year 
is the difference between what he's getting paid now and what he was going to get paid as a head coach. And to think about that being locked in for four, five, six years, probably five or six is the going rate. You know, you're talking about, you know, $70, $80 million, if I do quick math, the money that you're just not going with, and you're gambling on your ability to continue to, to generate those kind of contracts. So I think it's it's kind of taken at face value in, in a way. Yes, if you're the Harris group and there were all indications that that was a doable situation and you pulled the rug out from under you, you know, and people say all oh, your eggs in one basket. But if that was your favorite candidate and you were waiting to go land them, can you really blame them for that? You know? And it was a miscalculation. At the end, what matters is results. And it's a bad miscalculation. And it it caused them to not get maybe their second or third. Was a Raheem Morris, like we said, in their top three? Was a Mike McDonald that was too late, seemed to turn the page with him in that top three? You know, so it's it's, at the end of the day, results matter. And it's definitely a miscalculation on their, their part. And I guess we can pivot to like which one of these guys would we want at this point? And yeah, you know, the other theory is does, you know, you know, I, I look at the, you, you mentioned the, um, the Callahan hire being a surprise kind of snuck out of nowhere. Here's this OC for Tampa Bay and nobody was, wasn't really on anyone's radar as a top coaching candidate. Uh, Canales? Is there, a, is there a Brian Callahan out there that Adam Peters is looking at? Is there an assistant coach on the 49ers that he's looking at going, that's maybe we're hanging, you know, maybe there's something up his sleeve. Not to say there's that been... everything we just said wasn't true, but maybe the reason that they're not jumping on another one of these candidates is there is a, another option out there that they're they're looking at maybe I mean there's you know even on the Kansas City coaching staff is you know give Spagnola another run out of he he's done a pretty brilliant job I don't know I don't know what to think at this point there's been there's been a little bit of buzz today around Steve Wilkes the defensive coordinator for the 49ers um he's been a former head coach before he was the defensive coordinator in Carolina I want to say under Matt Rule and he took over there, and he did a really good job. He turned the team around. I mean, he really – like, they started winning games when he took over, and it was – Right. Uh, it was kind of viewed by the league as Tepper being an idiot, letting him go. Like, that was almost like an Antonio Pierce-esque situation where it's like, you should keep this guy in the building. He went back to San Francisco. Obviously, everything that San Francisco touches turns to gold. Um, so that's been a name that's been circulated. Um Greece is the guy's last name. I'm blanking on his first name. The quarterback's coach in San Francisco is another name that's being circulated. I got to tell you, hiring a quarterback's coach as the head coach after this whole thing gives me shivers. I don't like that. I don't like that one bit, even if he's Shanahan's you know, right-hand right. man or whatever. I don't know. The, the combined like Jim Zorn PTSD and the PTSD from hiring the guy who's not actually calling the plays to run the offense and how that went for us in the last year, those two things give me uh, give me anxiety about that. But <clears throat> like you said, to pivot to to who's next at this point, um, that leaves you with out of the guys we've interviewed so far, Aaron Glenn, Anthony Weaver. Dan Quinn, Eric Bieniemy. Now, Pop, do you have a favorite out of that group, or Absolutely. do you have somebody you definitely don't want out of that group, or any? Give me favorite, or give me somebody you definitely don't like. Bottom camp. You know, at the uh, out of that group, I'm not real excited about anyone. I can't really say and pick out a favorite. Yeah. Um, you know, the one I don't want, you know, I would say my least favorite options are probably EB and uh, I got to go get pull the names and Aaron Glenn, you know, because yeah. I think I Aaron Glenn, at the end of the day, I mean, you and I were talking about it. He coached, what, the 30th ranked defense or, you know, somewhere in that range. I mean, results matter. And like you said, you know, they're not devoid of talent in Detroit. 
they allowed a comeback to happen in the championship game, which was pretty terrible. I, I can't get excited about him. Um, you know, you know my feelings on Dan Quinn. It's all right. It's it's meh. It's just uninspiring. All signs point to Ron Rivera 2.0. Maybe maybe he's a little bit better. You know, just overall leader of men because there's one thing to be kind of a culture guy, but there's another thing to really truly lead. You know, people in playing. He's had some. You know, the one thing I do think is the fact that he's done it both as a he's had some success as a head coach. He's had a lot of success as a defensive coordinator, so he's proven to be a good X's and O's guy, which we talked about being an important criteria. But yeah. I don't know. Like I'm I'm almost I'm almost on to like doing a bit of a reset. You know, I John Kime had an interesting tweet, you know, just earlier and he talked about, you know, top five this was voted on by the NFLPA, so this is by players. Top five defensive coordinators, Aaron Glenn, Steve Wilkes, Dan Quinn, Brian Flores, and Raheem Morris. Well, some of those guys are still available that aren't on our list. Yeah. And then offensive coordinators, Frank Smith, Thomas Brown, Brian Schottenheimer, Brian Callahan, and Kellen Moore. Some of those guys are still available. You know, So, so maybe there is another offensive coordinator out there if we want to go with an offensive minded guy that we haven't really talked yeah. about yet that could be a fit. So I'm almost at none of the above and let's go, go figure it out. And, you know, you talked about Vrabel and dare I say it, Bill Belichick or, um, uh, you know, um, the guy that just got fired in Seattle. Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll. Draw a blank. Too many names flying in Pop's head. So I don't know now. Now, now it's kind of keeps bringing Wilkes up. That name seems to be surfacing as a as a yeah, you know, last second thing. And of course, there's oh, Adam Peters connection, being that he's leading that 49ers defense. So who knows? I mean, at this point, I think they're behind the curve not only in getting a head coach but also filling those assistant positions. That's kind of the scary right. thing, yeah. but. Maybe it makes sense to do a little bit of a reset and make sure you get the right guy from whoever's left. Yeah. Now, Pop, one thing I want to ask you, I'll get before we get into that, I'll give you my quick uh my quick takes on the yeah. candidates left. I think Anthony Weaver would be my first choice because I think he's the closest you have at maybe hitting like a Dan Campbell Hail Mary home run right now. Former player. Seems to be a leader. He's the rah-rah guy in Baltimore from what I've heard. It's it's actually reported that McDonald is almost more of like a Mike McDaniel type. Like he's kind of like a geeky, like weird dude, but he's just such a genius about football and he could sell you on that very quickly. Clearly he did with Seattle. I mean, it took him, what, 48 hours? Um, but I think uh, Anthony Weaver, younger guy, more of the rah-rah, tight gets the people going leader of men and yeah i think he's the closest that like we've seen a trend of young offensive mind sure but we've also seen a trend of former players quickly taking over and becoming coaches kevin o'connell is a former player um dan campbell obviously in all his success former player mike vrabel a lot of success in Tennessee. Shocking that he's on the coaching market. That was that shook the sports world up when Mike Vrabel got fired in Tennessee. And I want to talk about that as well in a moment. But these guys, these former players are – there's a growing movement of players liking to play for these types of guys. So Anthony Weaver would be my top candidate out of that group. Dan Quinn maybe next. And then the rest, I agree. I don't care. I'm not a I'm not an Eric Bieniemy guy. If they really wanted Eric Bieniemy to be head coach, they would have promoted him by now. I'm yeah, not it's just – I, 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 I think Aaron spending Glenn a minute Glenn. on EB, like I loved every press conference. I wasn't as bit concerned about him coaching hard. What I struggled with with EB, and although it, you know, did did cause some problems in the building that you can't completely ignore. Players didn't love it, and you can call him soft, and you could say whatever. I don't. I don't think Terry McLaurin's soft. Right. I don't think Sam Cosby's soft. Sam Cosby's ready to hate you in the mouth. Right. But, 
it's just the coaching. I don't know how you justify the way he coached the offense this year. I don't no. know how you can look at that and say that was good. And there's people – look, I get the fact that people really like EB and want him to succeed. I would like EB, and I want him to succeed. I, every week that I listened to him talk, I was like, this guy's awesome. And then I'd watch the game on Sunday and go, he sucks, right? Yeah. And it it just can't understand what he was thinking in terms of how he called that offense this this year. And you can make excuses and say, well, it was a bad offensive line, but okay, they couldn't protect the quarterback. And your strategy is to just drop back. If anything, you get more conservative in a situation like that. You try to protect the football. You try not to turn it over. You don't put a young, unproven quarterback in a position to fail week after week after week. You know, I just go to the Scott I think Turner, that, let, let's stick with the over. facts that we know. He was given a ton of he was given a ton of power and a ton of leeway and a ton of decision making opportunity. And he was running that show from all we know. And the results were what they were. So enough on EB. Yeah. Um, I really Agreed. don't you know, I, it scares me a little with these defensive coaches that he'll be given another shot at OC. And I think the way he's established himself in the building, I don't even know how a head coach would come here and really take control with an EB in the building. I just think that yeah. they need to move on. I wish them the best of luck going forward, but we'll see. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say, here's what here's what I really want to say. And I almost want to leave with this. And it's too bad it's it's this far in. That's on me. We don't know how good any of these guys are. As That's an coach. important point. We we don't know. You know, we don't know whether Ben Johnson is going to be a good coach. We don't know whether Mike McDonald's going to be a good coach. It's like drafting a quarterback. There's a very good chance that you know we talked about, we rattled off all these names. How many of them are going to be successful? You pretty much know a Harbaugh is going to be good. But of the rest of this group, if you if you exclude Harbaugh, maybe one or two of these guys actually does a good job. Yeah. At the end of the day, and ends up keeping their job for a second contract. How many of these guys are going to get a second contract? Maybe as a way to say it. we don't know. We don't know whether Dan Quinn is the best of the bunch. He might turn yeah. out to be. So I we think we don't even know if we're going to be here on Saturday. <laughs> That's right. So <laughs> like, it's not. We are all are panicking. We're all disappointed because there was hype built. But it's like talking about Caleb Williams and Drake May and Jane and Daniels. We don't know if one, two, or any of the three are going to be good players in the NFL. Yep. We don't know which one of these coaches is really going to be good. And that's why I think they need to take a deep breath, sit back. There's still a lot of great coaches out there in the NFL and really figure out, okay, from what we got left, what makes the most sense? And if the philosophy was, this is the type of person we want. We want to go younger. We want to go offensive-minded if possible. If not offensive-minded, this is what we want to get. Don't give up on that idea. Look at what's left and figure out. And like I said, go back to that Brian Callahan hire. Is there somebody out there that you kind of look at? Because Tennessee is a pretty solid organization. And they snuck under the radar and picked the guy out that they think has is, is got potential. Is there yeah. someone else out there like that, right? And if it ends up being a Quinn, let's just say it's Quinn and Biennemi, right, who a few days ago I would have said is my disaster scenario. Nuclear situation. I'm going to hope a couple things. I'm going to hope Dan Quinn's leadership abilities and his ability to coach up defense is going to come to fruition, and he's going to have learned from some of the mistakes he made the first time around. He did an impressive job in Dallas coaching up that defense. And I'm going to hope EB, all those positive quality talks, we talked about him carry over and he learns from his mistakes and he realizes that he's got to call things a little bit differently and he gets into year two and he really self-evaluates. And I, I do think he's capable of that. You know, I think there was a, we a saw lot of learning flashes. on the job. I think there was a lot of learning on the job that we saw from him. So maybe in year two, he does have the ability to step forward and, you know, maybe a Brian, you know, maybe a Dan Quinn says, EB, this is the kind of offense I want you to run. You're going to be my OC. You know, there's an interview that takes place. You're going to be my OC. This is what I want out of you. Can you give me that? 
And if they come to an alignment, maybe it can work. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, that's Yeah, that's an interesting scenario you outlined there, Pop. I think, for me, other than – I like Anthony Weaver. Mike Vrabel has got to be called. You have to make a phone call and interview Mike Vrabel at this point. Hey, Mike. Yeah, Ben screwed us. We'll be honest. We thought we were going to get him. He let us on. He told us he was out on the plane ride to Detroit. Would you consider coming down and having a conversation? Because Mike Vrabel is a guy that was coach of the year two years ago. Completely He's the most out accomplished Tennessee coach, you know, other than Belichick and um, – And he's young. Right. I mean, he's the, he's the most accomplished coach out there that isn't in, the, in his 70s. I'll he's 48. He's yeah. 48. He's just getting started as a head coach. And he, yeah. from what I understand about what happened in Tennessee, I have a source inside the building in Tennessee. You I do? Have a friend, I have a, a friend. Very who works, good source. I have a friend who works for the Tennessee Titans. And from what I understand from what happened in Tennessee. Future podcast was, potentially. Definitely, definitely. What I understand from what happened in D.C. was he, there was a new GM brought in because the last GM was a jackass, essentially. They brought in a new GM. The new GM and Mike Vrabel did not align on philosophy. And so Vrabel was out. They let him go. They wanted to Yeah, do, I mean you, you look at they you wanted at the, to do a parting of ways, but it was faster for them to just fire him. So they fired. And yeah, I mean the last two years, not great, seven and ten, six and eleven, but you look prior to that, nine and seven, nine and seven, eleven and five, twelve and five, and never really had a quarterback. Had a quarterback. He revived Ryan Tannehill. He made, he got to the one seed in the AFC. That 12-5 yeah. year, they were the number one seed in the AFC with Ryan Tannehill. The year before that, they ups was it the year before that or the year after that? I think it was the year before that. They upset the Ravens in the playoffs, who were the number one seed in the NFL, Lamar's MVP year. They went and they won that game. And then the next year, they were the number one seed. So I mean, I I guess I'm pounding on the table for Mike Vrabel at this point. The more I talk about it, the more fired up I am about it. And I think it's a guy that if we knew, like if it was a new ownership situation and they we knew they were going to blow that up, we would have been saying he's the number one candidate. But we got ourselves so fired up about this. I don't think he falls into the retread category the same way as Steve Wilkes or uh, Dan Quinn does. Um, and – if we knew that guy was going to be available, we would have been saying Vrabes is the guy to stabilize the ship right now. And that's yep. that's the po- that's the point I want to close with, right? I think there is a severe amount, and we've all we're all guilty of it. I think there's a severe amount of Ashburn syndrome around the situation in DC right now. And the I think that plays a Super Bowl. I think that played a factor in it. Sure, the only cure is a Super Bowl. Oh, the only <laughs> cure might be a 10-win season if this keeps going. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, we look at everything like this is going to be what saves us, right? New ownership, new general manager, first time, young guy, trained up, trained under against all the best, right? Number two overall draft pick, $80 million in cap space. We all look at that as, well, we're going to fill all our holes on the offensive line, build up. We're going to draft a quarterback. He's going to be a stud. And then we're going to get a coach. It's going to be a perfect pairing between the coach and the quarterback. And they're going to go on and be Drew Brees and Sean Payton. And they're going to bring us all this success, right? And in reality, what that spells for somebody that's looking for job security, a place to move their family and their legacy is volatility. That is an extreme amount of volatility. Nobody knows how the Harris Group does business in the NFL. Nobody knows how Adam Peters is going to be as a GM. Nobody knows if Drake May or Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams is actually going to be a good quarterback. And nobody knows what we're going to do with this $80 million in free agency. What we do know is this team was 4-13 and last year, and this roster stinks. So Let me ask you a question. It's created a little bit of a jam in the head coaching search, and I think that came up in the Johnson talks. But, but, but if, anyway. let me ask you a question. You can answer it honestly. If you had the if you had a choice, if I said to you, you can land the number one hottest GM candidate that's out there, or you can land the number one hottest coaching candidate that's out there, and you can only have one, which one would you pick? 
GM, 100%. The, right. I think we're so in alignment. My point is, is that the people that's, that, that want to quickly say it's doomsday right now, building up a roster and having that proven ability to do that on multiple championship level teams over and over and over again, that's much more important to the foundation of success. There are a lot of guys that can coach up a good roster and at least yeah. get you to the playoffs. Maybe they, they can't get you over the hump to championship, right? So I do think Andy Reid, you know, is a special coach, right? We all know how we feel about Kyle Shanahan. Yeah. They're, 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 they're probably the two best coaches in the NFL. They've also got great rosters. Yep. Pat Mahomes can win games for a lot of coaches out there, right? So I think we got Adam Peters. A lot of coaches could be successful under Adam Peters if he does his job right. I have no reason to believe that he won't based on everything that I've heard. You know, people are taking shots at him for, you know, you know, keeping um, some of the, some of the staff intact. There's nothing wrong with that. He's the one that's going to be calling shots at the end of the day. If he's and, familiar with Marty and has worked with Marty right. in San Francisco, why wouldn't nothing. he want to have his boy there? There's nothing wrong with that. There, there, there was a lot of, Talk that Martin Mayhew was minimized, you know, because of and the other helped. Marty, yeah, and, and Ron. So, like, I think if you sit down and you have a conversation with Martin Mayhew and say, "Was it your idea to draft that guy? Was it your idea to draft that guy? Who do you have on your board?" You have an honest conversation about how things were run and what his opinions were, and you like his answers. I like Martin Mayhew, solid guy. I don't want him at the top, but as a contributor to the team. Former Super Bowl champion for the Skins. Contributed to some winning teams before. I think my yeah. point being is with Adam Peters in place, what is not really knowing what any of these coaching candidates are really capable of, they're going to need to just do a bit of a reset. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise with the Ben Johnson. You know, you mentioned it really well. Yeah, it's disappointing. I still will stand by the fact that I think it's, you know, setback for them. And um, but definitely. what they need yeah, to do I, now, what I we all need to do is reset a little bit and make sure we're making the best decision that's available to us. Now, the the great thing now is there's no competition. We have our there's choice. There's a glass half full take if I've ever seen it's, it. It's, it, <laughs> it, it. It's a half quarter full, but there's no competition left, right? About right? two drops. You're at yeah. the bottom of that, you know, rum and coke and <laughs> You're really enjoying it, and you know you can't have another. It's a quarter full. You're going to enjoy last it. Little, last it's piece. the last little bit of the Miller Lite that you don't really drink. It just makes it into the can. <laughs> but nobody's nobody's competing you for, for you now. Maybe Rabel, I agree, don't quite get it. Very accomplished coach, but they got to figure it out. I would have – it's shocking that we're not talking head coaching candidate right now. It's shocking that we're not talking Super Bowl, but I promise – Next episode will be the Super Bowl preview, and we'll have a lot of fun yeah. with that. Hopefully, Shiver hopefully we'll be talking about, about situation we're in. Hopefully, oh. we're talking about you know the next head coach of our our team here in Washington as well. But not if it's going to be Wilkes. We're going to wait another two weeks. If it's anybody on not either two. of those staffs, well, at this point, yeah, okay, two weeks, ten days. If that's what they really believe is the right decision. You know, you got two 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 Super Bowl staffs to tap into still potentially, right? So there's got to be some pretty good assistance on both of those teams. So we'll see. We'll the see. Bags come over, run the defense, and then the enemy stays and runs the offense. And no. we put the band together without our, without uh. Not unless he does some crazy there. drugs between now and then. <laughs> he, ain't leaving, he ain't leaving KC for that. <laughs> All right, well, let's wrap up on that, man. What a what a disaster this whole situation has been. It's been a mess, but uh, hell, it wouldn't be the Washington, whatever you call it, if it weren't for uh, if it weren't for a little bit of extra dominant. But wrap this thing up. Tanned up. Not tanned up. <laughs> We're gonna get through it. September seventh uh, is gonna be here one way or another. Um, Without further ado, let's wrap this thing up. I've been Dom. This is Pop. Thanks for having me.